This video is brought to you by Squarespace. This is milk, source of some of my best and worst memories. I love milk so much that I once genetically modified myself to cure my lactose intolerance for 18 months. Milk and its many delicious derivatives are pretty fantastic, so it was 100% worth the risk. But have you ever looked at a cheese pizza and thought, God, I want to wear that as a sweater? No? Just me? Well, then maybe I've spent too long organizing the chemical cabinet lately, but I promise it is far less far-fetched than it sounds. And today, we're going to be exploring how you can turn regular milk into rope, fibers, and fabric. Bar Bar Black Sheep will have to look to his laurels, for in the world of wool, he isn't the big noise he used to be. An Italian inventor has discovered how to get wool from milk. At the moment, it's just plain, unadulterated cow juice, but you ain't seen nothing yet. The milk goes through a whole lot of processes, each of which brings it nearer the consistency of wool. Watch how it grows. In the 1930s, many countries were looking to become more self-sufficient, and while wool and other traditional fibers were enjoyed, they are labor-intensive and expensive to produce. Rayon had just been invented, and it was seen as a marvel. It allowed you to take a very cheap starting material, in this case wood and scrap cellulose, and turn it into strong, usable fiber that was just as good or better than cotton, and far less effort to produce. So people had begun to look for other potentially cheap feedstocks that they could turn into fiber to feed the ever-growing demand and cash in on the trend, all while potentially making their country more self-sufficient by allowing local production of goods. So in 1935, Antonio Foretti and SNIA Viscosa in Italy first began to produce fibers from milk that they sold under the brand name Lanital, and it enjoyed a decade or two of heavy use in the 1930s and 40s. But when acrylic-based fibers and other petroleum plastics became available, they massively undercut the price of milk fiber and were stronger too. So Lanital and similar products mostly died out. However, it has enjoyed a bit of a resurgence in the last decade or so because we now produce so much milk that it's actually viewed as a waste product. There's currently 1.5 billion pounds of cheese in just the U.S. cheese stockpile because demand for milk is dramatically lower than production. But because of that, you can actually still buy commercially made milk yarn. I picked some up so that way we can compare whatever we make to the professionally made samples. But you can see that it really does look like wool and feel just like it too. Here's a sample of real wool for comparison. Both are nice and fluffy and soft, both are about the same strength, and both can be dyed whatever color you want and have the same laundry requirements. Now. Making this is only even possible because one of the proteins in milk has a very special property. The protein in question, casein, makes up about 80% of the protein content in milk. But what makes it special is that it is highly responsive to changes in pH. Here, watch this. This beaker has just regular old whole milk in it. If I add some acid, in this case vinegar, after a few minutes the milk will separate into two layers, or as they're traditionally called, the curd and whey. Essentially all of the casein is now contained in the curd layer and can be easily removed by just straining it out. If we then remove as much of the water as possible, we've now made some simple cheese. Though if you do try this, make sure not to use a chemistry fritted filter and just stick to regular cheesecloth. If you do get great at cheese making, you may even want to try and sell some of your amazing, delicious creations. Or maybe you just want to post your cheese recipes to share with other cheese fanatics like yourself. Well, to do either, you're going to need a top quality website, and for that, look no further than the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it super easy to set up a website with their amazing suite of tools and website creation engine. With best-in-class templates and a huge collection of extensions, Squarespace makes it easy to set up the site of your dreams. Blog about your brie, sell some Stilton, or extol the virtues of Emmentaler. No matter the use, Squarespace has a template that'll suit your needs. So head to squarespace.com to start your free trial, and when you're ready to launch your site, go to squarespace.com slash thethoughtemporium to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And of course, there's some links below. Now, back to science. So we've already got a quick and easy way to extract the crude protein. But the part that makes cheese delicious is all the oils and flavor molecules that get trapped in here too. So if we want to just use the casein, we actually want to remove all that oil first before this coagulation step, which really just means using skim milk as the starting product. Conveniently, these days you can just buy ultra-pure casein as a protein powder for fitness stuff, which is what we're going to be using to avoid having to dry a ton of milk. 
But now, how do you turn this block of very bad cheese into a sweater? Well, it all comes down to pH again. Casein is readily soluble in highly basic solutions, so all it takes is a small amount of sodium or potassium hydroxide to make the casein dissolve into a smooth, goopy syrup. But if we now take this syrup and squirt it out of a thin needle into a solution of weak sulfuric acid, the protein will coagulate again and form a fiber. Now, as you can imagine, this very not food safe cheese string isn't very strong. The issue is that while casein will coagulate, there's nothing to actually chemically stick the individual proteins together. And this is currently basically just being held together with the static forces between the proteins. Which is to say that if I leave this in water, it'll eventually disintegrate into sludge. So to the acid solution, we add about 5% formaldehyde. This will chemically cross-link the proteins together into one large polymer network that will actually hold together. There are lots of other cross-linking agents that we could use here, from other aldehydes to acrylics and all kinds of other modern molecules. But formaldehyde is cheap and the traditional way to do this, and is actually one of the least bad chemicals to work with compared to the alternatives. Also, mixing casein with formaldehyde is actually how the original plastics were made, and originally this combination was used to make buttons and other hard items. But here we run into another problem. These crude noodles are a far cry from real fiber. In order to go from this basic concept to actual spools of fiber, we're going to need a serious hardware upgrade. So let me introduce our brand new wet spinning machine. This machine is very much a prototype, but it already works fairly well. It's largely made out of 3D printed parts, and everything is completely adjustable. It's designed to be modular so that it can be used to make any type of fiber that uses wet spinning in its creation. This of course includes the milk fiber we're going to make today, but it also includes everything from rayon and synthetic silks to nylon and carbon nanotubes. Though a quick caveat is that this isn't usually the way that milk fiber was made in the past. It was wet spun, but because of the limits of the strength of the fibers, a special process of extruding bunches of fibers which were then chopped and spun into wool-like yarns was used. The way our machine is set up is much more like how rayon or nylon would be made. That is to say that it produces a single long monofilament rather than bunches of chopped fibers. While it may look like there's a lot going on, the machine is actually super simple and it's basically just a bunch of wheels and baths, as well as a syringe pump to initially extrude whatever goop you happen to be using. It's all controlled by a custom made Arduino shield and stepper drivers, which in turn is controlled by a Raspberry Pi. Each wheel is connected to its own stepper motor so that they can be tweaked independently. To get things started, we need to mix up some milk goop so that way we can run it through the machine. The final mixture, called the spinning dope, is prepared through a straightforward but slightly time-consuming process. We start by making a 2% solution of potassium hydroxide, here we're preparing 100 milliliters worth. Then we add 21 grams of the casein powder. Because this goop absolutely loves to form bubbles, and the casein takes a long time to dissolve, a lot of air gets introduced as you mix it. So we added a few drops of a defoaming agent to keep the bubble formation to a minimum. This also speeds up the process of removing all the air bubbles later once the casein is fully dissolved. We let everything mix for about half an hour with our overhead mixer before moving on to the degassing step. The goop is then transferred to a vacuum chamber to pull out all of the bubbles. This takes a long time and has to be done in stages as it loves to foam over. We tend to lose a fair amount of liquid here to spill over, so generally mix up more than we need to account for the expected losses. We have to remove the bubbles because any that are left in the liquid could end up coming out of the needle and either causing a break in the fiber or a void that will weaken it. But once all the bubbles are out, it can be transferred to a syringe, which is then tipped with a 90 degree blunt tip needle and then loaded into the machine. Once the syringe is mounted, we lower the pusher part of the pump until it's pressed against the end of the syringe, and then keep going until goop starts to flow into the first bath. This bath contains the sulfuric acid and formaldehyde mixture from before, but it also has about 20% glucose in it to increase the viscosity of the bath and help the fiber form. This is called the coagulation bath. As a quick side note, how much more exciting is that archival footage now that you know what the workers are sticking their bare hands into? Ah, uh, the 1930s, an age before PPE or occupational safety was invented. 
When a nice initial booger has formed and we have enough to grab onto, we use a pair of forceps to start pulling the fiber through the machine. It's pulled onto the first wheel and then over and down into the next bath. This is called the hardening bath. It contains a large excess of formaldehyde to further cross-link the newly formed fiber. From there, it's up to the next set of wheels, which are the stretchers. Once the thread is started, the speed of these can be turned up so that each wheel is faster than the next. This will stretch the fiber, which makes it way stronger and helps align all the proteins. It also helps thin the fiber out. Finally, it's uptaken onto a spool for collection. We're already looking at a bunch of improvements we can make that'll make working with this machine much easier, like adding a groove to the wheels for the thread to ride in and a built-in dryer, as well as some improvements on how various things are mounted. But this is more than sufficient for this proof of concept. To go from a bunch of glass noodle looking cheese string to something that you might recognize as fiber, these first need to be washed in water to remove any remaining chemicals, and then unspooled onto drying lines, as if it was the pasta that it resembles. But once it's dry, it's obvious that these fibers are no longer the cheese that they started as. While these won't be breaking any records for tensile strength, if we just made them a little bit thinner and chopped them, this would 100% be passable as wool. Keep in mind, wool itself isn't very strong either. It feels strong when you wear it because of the fact that it's actually hundreds of very, very thin fibers mixed together. So the work is being shared and no individual fiber has to work that hard. But I wouldn't trust a knitted wool cozy to do any serious lifting on a construction site. However, since this is a prototype, our fibers are a wee bit big, and our syringe pump just doesn't have the force to use any smaller of a needle. So our fibers feel a little bit closer to hemp in their coarseness, which made us think, you know what this could be good for? Rope. We spent a few days spinning as much fiber as we could, and the result was a veritable haunted house worth of milky cobwebs. We started by securing a bundle of the fibers so that they could be braided together into a solid rope. We just went with a simple three-piece braid and only had enough fiber to make about a foot of rope. Though you actually have to apply a fair bit of force even at this stage to break the individual fibers, so our hopes were high for the rope. To start things off, we tried a really informal test of just using the rope as, well, rope, to pick up something heavy. In this case, about a kilogram of water in a water bottle. And yeah, sure enough, the rope is quite usable and can pick things up and be pulled on pretty hard. But as you can imagine, this doesn't actually tell us how strong the rope really is, so we need to use our tensile testing machine to get some proper data. Basically all it is is a force gauge, two clamps, and a motorized rail to pull the rope or fiber you're testing apart. We're still working on getting this thing to output data, so we can't graph it yet, but it gives us a peak force value, which I think will be interesting enough for today. Before we test the rope we made, we need to set some quick baselines so we have something to compare to. So first, here's some normal sheep's wool yarn. You can see that when we stretch it, it maxes out at 5.2 kilograms per foot. But the yarn doesn't just snap, because it's lots of fibers, they just start coming apart rather than failing suddenly. When we do the same thing with triple braided yarn, so that way we have a more fair comparison to the rope we made, we get a peak value of nearly 20 kilograms per foot. So you can see that braiding the yarns makes it a little bit stronger than you'd expect for just three pieces combined. Alright, with that baseline set, how does the homebrew milk yarn compare? Well, the individual fibers are too thin to measure as the claw cuts them before it can even apply tension. But the full rope worked great. At peak, it measured 18.5 kilograms per foot, which is nearly the same as the wool. Keep in mind, these fibers are way too thick, and so are going to be more prone to brittle failure. So they snap much more than the yarn did. But strength for strength, it's very comparable, and made properly, this is basically nearly identical to wool. And while the modern milk yarns are made with acrylates as the crosslinker, I think there's a lot of room for the traditional version. Unlike acrylates, formaldehyde crosslinked casein should biodegrade readily once you're no longer using it. But until then, it works great as a very wearable, usable yarn that can be washed and dyed just like the real thing. I'd love to see a truly biodegradable version of this that is made like the original recipe re-enter the market. With the sheer amount of cheese and milk being wasted, it seems like a very eco-friendly option. But I think that's where I'll leave it on the milk fibers. This has been a huge success, and I'm thrilled that the machine works as well as it does. A little bit more refinement, and this is going to be a really awesome system. For those that want to build one for themselves, you're going to need to wait a little while longer before we post the code, 3D printing files, and drawings for the machine. It obviously works, but there's a bunch of tweaks I want to make to it. So when it's in a more finished state, we'll be posting all of the plans on our GitHub as usual. And I'm really keen to try using it to make some carbon nanotube fiber and other interesting materials. So this won't be the last time you see this machine. 
And if you'd like to help us do that, the best way you can support the show is by sharing the video and consider becoming a patron of the channel. Our amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi go a long way to help us feed our monstrosities and build cool projects like this, so a huge thanks to them. And supporters and patrons get access to our supporter Discord, so if that's something you're interested in, there's some links below. But that's where I'll leave it for now, and we'll see you next time.